The Unshackled Waves, episode 215. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now, many viewers of this show will have noticed that I've been releasing episodes differently these past few weeks. I've been utilizing the premiere feature on Facebook and YouTube, which allows you to release a video as if it were a live stream with your followers and subscribers able to interact with you and other viewers in real time. It's proven to be a great success for the Waves program with many tuning in on both platforms to watch at the premiere in time. And there has been lively discussion in the comments. So I'm pleased to announce that this innovation will continue and if you listen to the show via podcast it is released on your favorite podcasting platform at the exact same time to listen at your own convenience during the summer i have been releasing an episode once a week as i've had other commitments over this period but the show is back to being released multiple times per week i'm aiming for three but don't hold me to that i've certainly got some exciting shows lined up which i hope to bring to you shortly With the Australia Day long weekend over, it is now back to school time for children and parents alike, but the reality is unfortunately our modern education system and its curriculum is controlled by the far left education establishment. Students these days across all year levels are indoctrinated in anti-Western historical revisionism, subjected to social re-engineering, sexual and diversity programs, and are encouraged to become adherents to left-wing ideas. Meanwhile, we are falling down the international education rankings. One education expert who has been on the front line of exposing and fighting back against the left's march through the education system is Dr. Kevin Donnelly AM, who is a conservative education commentator, and he's also a senior research fellow at the Australian Catholic University and director of the Education Standards Institute. His commentary on education and other cultural issues appears regularly in the News Corp publications, and he has written several books. The most recent are How Political Correctness is Destroying Australia and How Political Correctness is Destroying Education, both by Wilkinson Publishing. He appears regularly on television and radio to comment on educational developments, and we are lucky that he is our guest today to give a comprehensive overview of where the Australian education system is at. Kevin, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be involved. Now, you were a teacher back in the the 1990s, and that was the time when I myself went through the education system. And I recall the the indoctrination and the the political correctness wasn't too bad in, in my day. We still got quite a bit of good Australian history and Western history, but it was when the the leftist takeover was in its beginning. What did you start to notice then uh, as a teacher? I started teaching in the uh, mid to late eighties and uh, taught for 18 years. Round about that time, uh, well, after four or five years of teaching, I went back and did a uh, postgraduate work in education. So I was teaching in Melbourne, Victoria, In those years, Joan Kerner became uh, the education minister and then the Victorian premier. Now, obviously, Joan Kerner was a member of the ALP. She was actually in the socialist left faction and she gave a speech at the Fabian in the Fabian Society in Melbourne some years ago, where she argued that education should be part of the socialist struggle for uh, overthrowing capitalism. She actually talked like that. Wow. Uh, And as education minister, that was one of the reasons she wanted to get rid of what was then the higher school certificate at year 12 and to have the Victorian certificate of education because she felt that academic studies, competition, especially non-government schools, the fact that they were funded, that was all disadvantaging working class migrant students. So she was a very committed socialist Uh, She made made no bones about that. And as I said, I was teaching in a government school at the time, and I just felt that education was starting back then, even earlier, to be used by what I call the cultural left to indoctrinate students with the curriculum in subjects like uh, English history, especially uh, literature, but also the history of Australia and Western civilization. 
The idea then was to indoctrinate students in areas like multiculturalism, gender and sexuality, the class war, uh, sustainability environment. And so when I was doing the postgraduate work, the masters and the doctorate, I discovered that in fact there was quite a lot of theoretical underpinning for what was happening in terms of not just Victoria, but also England, America and Europe. Wow, that's incredible. I'd never heard Joan Kerner say that before. That's extremely uh, radical. Now, in your work, you've uh, talked about the role of the, the teachers union. The main one is the Australian Education Union. They've got in their, their union documents that this is what they want to do to the curriculum, how they want to, to educate children. Can you go into a bit uh, more detail about that? I was actually a member of the Victorian Secondary Teachers Association for about 12 years until I resigned. They're now part of the Australian Education Union. And uh, I wrote a book some years ago, Dumbing Down. More recently, a book uh, was published last year, How Political Correctness is Destroying Australia. This year, a second book, How Political Correctness is Destroying Education. And I, in both books, talk about the Australian Education Union. They really became uh, part of the vanguard, if you like. If you look at their curriculum policy in areas like gender and sexuality, class war, as they called it. Also, uh, during the Howard government, they were opposed to the American and Australian involvement in Iraq. They're very strong on Indigenous affairs, environment. As I was a member, again, I got to know firsthand what the VSTA, now the Australian Education Union, what they sought to do. And they were pushing a very cultural left view of the curriculum, picking up on people like Bowles and Gintis in America, MFD Young in England, Bill Hannon in Australia. And they argued again against funding non-government schools, Catholic, independent. They argued against academic studies, against competition. Uh, they argued that was elitist, unfair, and even uh, got to a stage where some argued for what they call a working class curriculum, where you don't teach standard English, you don't teach the classics of our literature, you don't teach Western civilization, uh, because that supposedly disadvantages working class migrant students. So the AEU has been a very strong advocate of what I call a cultural left view of education. And you only have to look at their curriculum policy to see that. And it shouldn't surprise that most of the time they support green and ALP policy on education. Yeah, a lot of them you'll find at the, the polling booths on election day. Now, you've uh, a critic of what's described as what you've described as the, the fads in the education system. Some of the ones you've listed are child centered and inquiry based learning, uh, open classrooms as opposed to traditional teaching, which emphasizes order, discipline and instruction based classrooms. Now, where have these ideas for these fads come from, especially in a field such as education, which is supposed to be backed up by research? I mean, that's a very good question, something they should be looking at in teacher education, but they often don't uh, look into the history of this. You can actually trace it back to the French philosopher Rousseau. He wrote a book many, many years ago, uh, Emile, which in it he talked about how best to educate young people. And he had what is called a romantic view, a progressive view of how to educate children. And it was based on the idea that children would grow naturally towards education, towards learning, that a bit like if you water a rose bush, it would grow towards the light. It didn't need to be uh, disciplined or structured or taught. It was somehow organic. Now, this romantic view of education, it's been there for some hundreds of years. But during the late 60s, it became more fashionable in education to go back to that. In England, there was uh, a school called Summerhill. In Australia, in Melbourne, there was a school called Press Hill, which is still there. In America, there was the de-schooling movement, people like Freire, Illich and others. They argued that you got rid of traditional schooling. You, you no longer had a teacher who was an authority figure standing at the front of the room teaching directly. 
that you should move over to what they called then a child-centred view of education, which was very much based on Rousseau's idea that education was organic, natural. The way they teach reading, for example, in the early years, for many years now, has been based on whole language. And the idea there is that you don't have to explicitly teach young children how to read. They don't need to know phonics, phonemic awareness, how letters, sounds and combinations of letters go together, that if you immerse children in language, if you give them lots of picture books, if you surround them with print, they will somehow learn naturally. Now, all the research is showing in America, England and Australia, and we quoted this in our review of the national curriculum that we did in 2014, all the research is showing, in fact, that this progressive approach does not work that you need what they call explicit teaching. You need teacher-directed instruction without being too formal or arid. You also need with young children, especially in primary school, to get them to memorize times tables, do mental arithmetic, learn poems, ballads by heart, because you have to actually, uh, like a computer, you have to actually program these young minds so that learning becomes automatic. So progressive education, what I call child-centred, has become the orthodoxy, if you like. It didn't happen in Singapore, Japan, South Korea, those countries that outperform Australia in the international maths and science teaching, uh, things like TIMS and PISA. It didn't happen overseas in those Asian countries, but it's something that's happened in England, America, Australia. And it's one reason our students in Australia underperform. Yes, for all of this radical, enlightening change over the past 50 years in the education system, and plus all the extra billions and billions of dollars that governments have put into the education system, that's all our politicians promise these days, we've actually fallen in the, the international uh, rankings and in the traditional areas of uh, student results are slipping. That's true. and. Uh... Even Andrew Lee, when he was at the ANU as a, as a researcher, he's now an ALP academic, a member of parliament from Canberra, a federal, a federal member of parliament. In the research he did, he shows very clearly that notwithstanding the additional billions spent on education over the last 20, 30 years, results have either flatlined or gone backwards. Now that's one measure, NAPLAN, uh, the testing at year three, five, seven and nine. Another measure is TIMS and PISA, the international testing, where we're going backwards, as I mentioned, and all the research both here and at the OECD in Europe proves that it's not about funding, it's not about spending more money. And the evidence is clear that those countries that generally do a lot better than we do, if you look at what happens in the classroom, the pedagogy, uh, how teachers actually work, in the classroom. If you look at the curriculum, that's where the solution is. It's not about spending more money. And that's why I've been a very strong critic of Gonski, the Gonski funding model, because the debate over the last four or five years since Julia Gillard was Prime Minister and Kevin Rudd is that it is about money. The Australian Education Union argues all the time additional funding will lead to better results, stronger outcomes. That's clearly not the case, and our recent history proves that is just a waste of money. Now, as you mentioned, you reviewed the national curriculum, uh, which was first released by the Rudd-Gillard governments, and that had three cross-curriculum areas, which was Australia's engagement with Asia, environmental sustainability, and Indigenous issues. You were commissioned by Christopher Pine to review it with, I can't remember the name of the, the other person. Ken, you, Wilch was Ken Wilshire. Yeah. What did you find when you reviewed it? What did you recommend? And do you feel that in the end it made a difference to how the national curriculum is being implemented? To answer your last question first, it didn't make really any difference. Minister Pine, Christopher Pine at the time, really didn't act on our recommendations, which was a great shame because we're now <clears throat> still suffering that problem. So nothing was really done in terms of our recommendations. But what we found, and we spent over seven or eight months traveling around Australia, 
talking to all the curriculum organisations, bodies, the experts, we found a number of problems with the national curriculum. And so it really uh, began with the fact that when we spoke to teachers, school leaders, that the curriculum is overcrowded. They're expecting schools and teachers to implement too much, especially at primary school. If you try and actually do the national curriculum, you just don't have enough days in the week, enough hours in the day. And so what happens then is that the curriculum becomes very superficial, what the Americans would say, a mile wide and an inch deep. And it becomes very fragmented as well. So one of the things we recommended strongly was the curriculum be cut back and that schools have greater flexibility and choice in terms of what they specialise in, in terms of what they teach. So there might be a core curriculum, which is mandatory, uh, whether that's English, mathematics, science, for example, but then you would give schools greater flexibility and freedom. The second thing we recommended was that there be a greater focus on Western civilization and the impact and significance of Judeo Christianity. Our argument was, and many of the submissions supported this, is that given the curriculum in, in most of the subjects, nearly all of them, across all the year levels, from prep to year 12, sorry, from prep to year 10, given that the national curriculum mandates that there be these priorities, Indigenous, Asian, sustainability, especially Indigenous, where kids have to learn about Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander culture, history, spirituality. We argued, well, we are a Western liberal democracy, a relatively new country. Since the arrival of the First Fleet, 1788, we have adopted much of what the UK and Europe embody in terms of our political and our legal institutions, things like Magna Carta, Common Law, Westminster Parliament, but we've also been very much influenced by Christianity in the New Testament. Our parliaments begin with the Lord's Prayer. Our constitution, and most people don't know this, the preamble to the constitution refers to Almighty God. Now, we didn't argue we should proselytise or teach, force young kids to accept religion. We did say, though, that to be culturally literate, to understand Australian culture and history, there needed to be a greater focus. Christianity is rarely mentioned in the curriculum at the moment. There's no recognition of what the significance is of Christian either funded or inspired hospitals, schools, welfare organisations, aged care. I mean, by some figures, over 40% of our social structure is underpinned by Christianity and much of our literature, our music as well. So we argue two things to begin with. The curriculum be simplified, cut back, but there'd be a greater focus on Judeo-Christianity and Western culture. Yes, but you and I both know that the, the ant and Western climate in academia and in the, the media has become so prevalent that if you want to talk about Western history, the achievements of Western civilization, you're accused of being a neo-colonialist, of idolizing a white uh, society. And of course, if you mention the, the benefits of Christianity, then uh, you're accused of covering up all of the, the various things that uh, Christianity has done wrong over, over the years. I mean, you just have to look at how d difficult it has been for the Ramsey Center uh, for Western civilization to get a foothold in uh, universities to offer something that at least uh, is objective about the West. That's certainly correct. The Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization. I mean, there's a debate there whether it will be effective if it goes into a university. Such is the ideological nature, uh, what I call the cultural left. Its long march through the institutions has been very successful. There was, uh, he died only some years, well, four or five years ago, I think it was, Pierre Rickman was an academic at the ANU and Sydney University, famous uh, sinologist, who was one of the first to discover what was actually happening in China under Chairman Mao during the Cultural Revolution. And he was ostracised. I think in the end he had to leave Europe because he was so critical of what Mao was doing. And at the time, the majority of academics were very pro-communism, pro-Mao, uh, 
And so he suffered because of that. But Pierre Rickman uh, gave a Boyer lecture, the ABC Boyer lecture, some years ago now, but he argued at the time that such is the success of the Long March that universities now are basically dead in terms of their purpose, that they're no longer able to be places of learning, of wisdom, of truth, of objectivity, of impartiality. They're now about imposing a very strong ideological view of matters, whether it's history, gender. You only have to look at the arguments against the Ramsey Centre, where hundreds of academics at ANU Sydney, even at Melbourne University, have argued that you cannot teach to acknowledge or celebrate Western culture because it's Eurocentric, patriarchal, misogynist. This whole idea of post-colonial theory, for example, argues there's nothing reasonable or beneficial about Western civilization. Uh, there are some courses overseas and here in Australia based on the supposition that they have to teach students about whiteness, that if you're white, you're guilty. It's like original sin yeah. and you can't escape it. So it's a fundamental problem that we haven't really addressed yet, but it's something I think people are becoming increasingly aware of. Universities, as you probably know, now have trigger warnings for particular books, literature or history. They now have safe spaces for uh, so-called identity groups, victim groups. Really, it's a, a great shame that what's happened, and you only have to look at what happened to Geoffrey Blaney some years ago at Melbourne University, where he was run out. Peter Ridd in Queensland last year had to uh, suffer because he questioned global warming, the impact on the Barrier Reef. The three students in Queensland who were taken before the, uh, the Human Rights Commission because they dared to be critical after being thrown out of a computer centre that was only supposedly for Indigenous students. So political correctness really has won the battle there and uh, there's a lot to do to really address that. Now, you've described the battle that we're in to get some Western civilization into the, the curriculum. Meanwhile, the, the left has pretty much been able to get all of their radical ideas, not just into the curriculum, but into uh, schools as a whole. And, and thankfully, there has been some scrutiny of that. There's uh, been a lot of uh, attention drawn to the, the Safe Schools program and the, the one that we have in Victoria, the Respectful Relations relationships program. Uh, now they're called teacher resources, not uh, curriculum, but that's just as dangerous. And, and these programs have been years in the making. And as we mentioned before, they're, they're part of the goals of the teachers union. True. And uh, in Victoria, what worried me the most, and uh, a lot of other people, by the way, is that the Labor government, the Andrews government, after they really mandated respectful relationships and safe schools, which are radical gender and sexuality programs that also present a very negative black view of men and boys in terms of gender and family violence. After they mandated that for government schools, they then said, well, let's cut back on religious education. And I don't mean religious instruction in terms of teaching the faith, I mean, what happens in terms of when students learn more about religion more broadly and its significance and contribution. Mm -hmm. So we've had, uh, and all governments around Australia, state governments allow this, we've had a very long history of Christianity, of Judaism, whether it's Buddhism, Islam, but mainly Judeo-Christianity taught in schools and that's been accepted. But in Victoria, no, that's been pushed out of the school day. It's now difficult to teach, but at the same time, we're saying radical gender and sexuality programs should be, should be introduced. Rod Ward, who was at La Trobe University, who helped design safe schools, she admits, and I, again, I've got no problem with this, that she's a radical uh, Marxist lesbian. That's fine. Uh, she's entitled to her beliefs as Joan Kerner was, <laughs> but what Ros Ward then goes on to say, and she admitted this at a Marxist conference only two years ago, is that safe schools is not about 
stopping bullying. Most people thought it was about diversity, respecting diversity, being tolerant. But who, <laughs> Ros Ward, who was primarily responsible for it, says, no, it's not about stopping bullying. It's about imposing this rainbow alliance of gender theory. Uh, it's about the socialist revolution where you get rid of this binary idea, what they call being heteronormative or transphobic or homophobic. So she had this kind of Marxist idea that you have what Mao called a cultural revolution in terms of gender, where primary age children, boys, if they self-identify as girls, that's fine. If girls self-identify as boys, even better. And if they want to use the toilets or changing rooms of the new sex that they identify as, well, they should be allowed to do that. So it's not just Victoria. Western Australia was in the news only recently, the government over there, for pushing respectful relationships on schools as well. So that's one example of a program that really is based on a very radical Marxist inspired view of gender and sexuality. And it's probably the most egregious example, but it's only one example of a lot of others where there's evidence that the cultural left has really taken the long march, as we call it, and has taken control of the curriculum, both in secondary, primary schools and at the tertiary level. It's interesting you mention Ros Ward, how she said she wanted children to be gay and communist. We've actually seen, well, now that they've got all these types of social indoctrination programs in school, teachers are becoming much more open about their political ideology and agenda. We've had the Teachers for Refugees group. We've had the, the, the climate protests where students took a day off school to attend climate change protests. And there was a teacher recently who was exposed saying on social media, she wanted to teach children to vote against the Liberal Party, which is basically taking it up a step further. In, in the book last year that was published, uh, How Political Correctness is Destroying Australia, I, I look at this issue in some detail. I suppose I was fortunate enough to be in the Australian Education Union, or as it was known then, the VSTA in Victoria. But also I was a member of the Victorian Association Teachers of English, and the National English Teachers Group Association. Both of those groups are on the public record condemning conservative governments, especially during the Howard years. So the Australian Education Union argued at the time that we joined America in invading Iraq after 9-11, the AEU publicly argued that teachers should use the classroom to argue against our involvement in Iraq they should support teachers, uh, the union should support teachers who take that view, and teachers should actually tell students and help students to take to the streets to go on strike. Now, we saw that more recently where there was a national strike by students over global warming, and a number of academics, a number of teachers said, well, even primary age children of eight or 10 have the right to go on strike to demonstrate Obviously, these young kids really have enough trouble writing a sentence or knowing how to do a basic algorithm in mathematics. But supposedly, they're now intelligent enough to make quite complex decisions about global warming. The Australian Education uh, Union is guilty of that. The National Teachers Association, AATE, their journal some years ago ed ed editorialised that it was a great complaint or a great crime that the Howard government was re-elected. And this was evidence that English teachers had failed to teach critical literacy, that English teachers had failed to teach young people how to think clearly or rationally, or I'd argue correctly, because supposedly so many had voted for the return of a conservative government. And what the editorial went on to say is that in the English classroom, picking up on uh, the South American Marxist Paulo Freire, that what English teachers should be doing is teaching young kids to be critically minded, to oppose capitalism, to oppose the status quo, to undermine conservative governments. And so it became more about indoctrination than actually teaching what we used to teach as in clear thinking. 
as I mentioned, they're, they're becoming extremely open about it. And that's, you've only mentioned a few examples there. There's countless other examples of teachers and academics wanting to impose these agendas. Now, we should also point out that there are many uh, good teachers in the education system. I'm sure you've met plenty of them. So have I have said that I can't stand what is happening to the education system, but I feel that I have no voice to basically speak up and raise my objections or how am I meant to teach children in a way, in a traditional way. What advice do you give to them? I mean, it is very difficult. I always make the point that I've been critical of teacher academics, like the professional subject associations, whether it's the English teachers or the history teachers, groups like the Australian Curriculum Studies Association, uh, some of the uh, teacher academics, especially at Latrobe, where I went, I'm generally very critical of those people. Classroom teachers are doing a very difficult job under very onerous conditions. They're expected to do so much now that parents once did. They're being forced to become bean counters, as I call it, where there's so much focus now on accountability, on red tape. You've got a federal government, you've got a state government, both imposing all of these mandates on teachers and classrooms. So I generally differentiate between classroom teachers, most of whom are genuinely concerned and interested in helping young people learn and those responsible for what happens in the classroom in terms of the curriculum and in terms of teacher training. I mean, the second thing here to remember is that there are many schools, especially but not always in the non-government school sector that are more independently minded, that do have a greater ability to, if you like, sidestep a lot of the propaganda and indoctrination. There are very good tertiary institutes like Campion College in Sydney. There are still the odd faculties of education around Australia where you can get a good teacher education. But I think one of the reasons we have a high attrition rate in teaching and one reason why it's not a profession a lot of young people are now choosing is because there is a sense that it has been captured. I don't believe it's always about the paying conditions. I think there's more an issue here, especially for young men, that the classroom, the staff room, schools aren't really places that will support them and give them the flexibility, flexibility and freedom to get on with what they might enjoy and know how to do. Now, thankfully in Australia, we do have a certain degree of school choice. Parents, they don't have to go to the state education system that they can go to a Catholic or independent school. But in the past six months, we've seen religious schools under attack, which came from this, the Ruddick review into religious freedom. And it's now become this bipartisan approach that we need to limit the freedom of religious schools to protect gay students from being expelled. But it's, as has been revealed, it's more about limiting the influence, well, the ability of these schools to actually practice their faith and teach their ethos? Uh, there are a couple of issues here. Uh, you're right, there is an opposition to non-government schools, Catholic and independent. Catholic schools around Australia, mainly the systemic schools that are part of the Catholic system, they teach over 20% of students approximately. Independent schools, over 90% are faith-based, whether Anglican or Presbyterian or Jewish or Islamic. They teach about 14%. So approximately 34% of students go to religious or faith-based schools. Those enrolments grew significantly during the 80s and 90s. There was a period there where government school enrolments only grew by one or 2%. If you look at uh, religious schools, it was more like 15, 20%. Now, groups like the Australian Education Union argued very strongly that funding should be cut to non-government schools. Part of the reason was because they were losing enrolments, government schools were losing enrolments. And so the AEU plus sympathetic academics argued that they should no longer be funding or they shouldn't be funding going to Catholic and independence. There's always been a dislike for religious schools because again, the AEU and others argue supposedly that we're a secular society, 
even though that's only one aspect of our, our civilization, our culture. We're also deeply religious in terms of its underpinnings. But they argue because education should be secular, then there's no place for religious schools being funded. Now, again, I disagree with that. The second point here is that as a result of the Gonski review of funding some seven or eight years ago now that Julia Gillard, when she was education minister, initiated, that funding review was captured by the cultural left and it really mirrored what the AEU wanted. So it argued that independent Catholic schools not be as properly funded or fully funded as they might be. And that's been the argument over the last year or two. You might remember that Simon Birmingham, the Liberal Minister for Education, was attacked a number of times, yes. especially by Catholic Education in Melbourne, Stephen Elder, for denying Catholic schools adequate funding. So there are two issues here. One is the sort of cultural left wanting to push a secular agenda. The other is funding. Now with the secular agenda, and this is where I'm worried about the Ruddock Review of Religious Freedom. The recommendations have not been released, but there is a lot of pressure here to curtail the right religious schools currently have, even though they really, if ever use it, to uh, be uh, in control of who they employ and who they enrol. Obviously, these religious schools want the power, the control over their own school management, to employ and enrol students and staff who are in agreement with their ethos and, and their school climate. If you look at what's happened overseas, if schools don't have that freedom, they get into trouble. In London, Jewish schools, Christian schools have been penalised by the inspectors for not teaching the government's view of gender and sexuality. In Canada, parents have been in trouble for saying they don't want their children to go to government school classes where they're again taught this radical gender theory. So if schools lose that religious freedom, there's a danger that they'll be forced to implement policies that run counter to their religious beliefs and their religious faith. Now, we've talked most of this episode about the, the problems in the, the education system and how the, the left ha have taken over the, the various controls over curriculum and other programs. But I wanted to finish off with some policy solutions. As I just mentioned, we have a degree of school choice. In Australia, there's been talk of giving principals more autonomy over schools so they can be more reactive to what parents and the community expect and also a performance pay for teachers because that's something the teachers union has been opposed to but would attract more high quality teachers to the system and make teaching a more attractive uh, vocation. I've done uh, possibly I think five international benchmarking projects over the last 20 years trying to identify what it is about those stronger performing education systems what it is that we can learn from in Australia in terms of how to strengthen our schools, improve our outcomes. Now, there's no simple solution. There's no magic bullet, uh, as the Americans would say. And not everything is transferable. If you look at those Asian countries, for example, there's a strong Confucian ethic in terms of respecting teachers, respecting learning. So-called tiger mums are very strong in pressuring their children to do well. We, we don't have that in Australia. We tend to, uh, you know, look at sportsmen, uh, sportswomen, rather than academics as mentors and figures to look up to. There, there are some things we can't transfer to Australia, but there are some things we can learn from. One is what I argue in terms of, I mentioned the book before, about diversity and choice and school autonomy. That if you free up schools, that's one of the ways that you can enable schools to better reflect their communities. If schools have within broad guidelines, the power to employ their staff, to reward their staff, to get rid of teachers who aren't up to it. If schools have a greater degree of flexibility in terms of the curriculum, what they teach, how they teach it, in terms of classroom pedagogy, then instead of having a one size fits all approach, if you get it wrong, where everyone suffers, instead of having a bureaucratic, intrusive 
inflexible approach. If you free up schools, this idea of choice and diversity and school autonomy, then you have a better chance of achieving a more effective school system. In America, and to a degree in South America, also in England, even New Zealand now, they're pushing the idea of what they call charter schools in America, community schools in New Zealand, free schools or academy schools in England, where that's exactly what's happened. They're saying, government is saying, let's reduce the bureaucracy, the red tape, let's reduce the control of the teacher union, uh, enterprise bargaining, a one size fits all system. Let's give schools greater autonomy and flexibility to a degree that if uh, there are philanthropic groups or corporations or universities who want to get involved with schools, they can do that. So give schools greater autonomy, greater flexibility. That's one solution. The other is to look at the evidence about what is the most effective pedagogy. I mean, it's not rocket science. You can look at those classrooms around the world that are more effective in teaching and learning. And the research is clear that what you need to do is to get away from the fads, what they call progressive learning or a constructivist approach, which is all about open classrooms, mixed ability teaching, teachers as facilitators, guides by the side, using a lot of technology, which is proven not to work. So you can look at the evidence in terms of the research and you should be ensuring that what happens in teacher training, what happens in the classroom is based on the evidence. Now, a third area about teachers and rewarding them in terms of uh, merit-based pay, I'm a little bit wary of that because having taught for 18 years, and I taught mainly year 11 and 12, I was happy to say we achieved very good results at the school. I was at the last school at year 11 and 12, but I was not responsible primarily for that as a year 11 and 12 teacher. A lot of that work had been done in upper primary, lower secondary. And so teaching is a collaborative affair. You are working with a number of colleagues and often learning students being engaged, being motivated, getting the content right in terms of essential learning, understanding and skills, that can take three or four or five years. And so it often is very difficult to pinpoint the actual moment or teacher responsible. So I'm just a bit uncertain of teacher pay or leading it to performance. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective. And hopefully the, the other policy proposals you outlined, hopefully there is some light at the end of the tunnel. It would certainly be a refreshing if we learnt the lesson from charter schools overseas and other types of getting back to traditional teaching. I've certainly appreciated your contribution on the, the show today, Kevin. Keep fighting the, the good fight and I encourage everyone to read your columns in the, the major newspapers and of course uh, read all of your books. I've got them all at home. They're, they're certainly a great read. And I'll, I'll have to give the book a plug. Uh, Wilkinson Publishing, they've done the last two books. They're available, you can buy them uh, from Wilkinson Publishing or from uh, Dimmix or Angus and Robertson. And I mean, I'm becoming more optimistic, people such as yourself, but also the number of emails I'm getting, the number of responses on Twitter. There is a groundswell, I think, of parents and other teachers who are genuinely concerned about these issues. And I think the tide is beginning to turn. So thank you very much. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The 2019 events calendar is beginning to fill up. In February, we have the Deplorables Tour, which still hopes to feature Gavin McGuinness, Tommy Robinson and Milo Yiannopoulos, hosted by Penthouse Australia. There is Dr. Jordan B. Peterson's return to Australia with special guest Dave Rubin and Dr. Stephen Hicks's first visit to Australia hosted by True Arrow Events. Then in March, there is a conversation about feminism tour with bad feminist Roxane Gay and the factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which will prove to be a lively discussion. The tour is hosted by This Is 42. 
Remember, the Unshackled can only continue to operate and expand with the support of our followers. You can still pledge over at Patreon at patreon.com slash the Unshackled and directly via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash the Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. And soon we'll be on Subscribestar and be able to receive cryptocurrency contributions. Another way to support our work is by buying some right thinking merchandise at our store at uprightmarket.com. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.